Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Demarcus Battle. And I am Raynika Battle. And we want to welcome you back to Bible with the Battles. We are so excited to start our brand new Bible study series entitled Miracles. Miracles, y'all. Yeah, yeah. This is an awesome subject to study. And we're going to explore the purpose of miracles. Um, we're going to look at the miracle working power of Jesus and what happens when mayhem enters your life and how miracles often break through during those times of great challenge. So we're excited to dig into this, y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we go ahead and start unpacking the scripture and looking at, you know, different definitions for miracles, we're going to go ahead and open up in prayer. All right. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to spend in your presence, to open up your holy word, to share it with your people. We pray that all of those that here would be blessed, Lord God, that the word would take root in their hearts and manifest according to your will. We ask all these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead and dig in here. What is a miracle, right? A miracle? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, mm -hmm. uh, Renika is going to, you know, give you a definition and kind of mm -hmm. set some, uh, some precedent here, and then I'll go ahead and add some additional stuff. So what yeah. you got? And so I just simply went to the dictionary and found that it said that it is an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. Mm. And I won't even dig into that right now. I'll just yep. read my definition. Yep. Nope. That's good. <laughs> that, that'll preach all by itself from the Webster's Bible. No, I'm joking. <laughs> all right. And um, I just want to add to that, right? Um, a, a miracle is God activity. Mm. I like that, right? Mm. In which he arouses people's awe and wonder and, listen to this, bears witness to himself. Mm. So I won't, you know, further expound on that either. We'll just leave the definition. And then yes. uh, here's another little part. Miracles give evidence that God is truly at work and so serve to advance the gospel. That's key. That's, that's very key. That's very, very key. Mm -hmm. Now, we've given you a definition for miracles. What about a purpose or purposes for miracles? Well, I got, I got two for you here. Yep. Okay. Number one, to glorify God. Absolutely. Okay, that's very important. When miracles occur, we should credit God, who is the source of the miracle, yeah. not the human agent who is the channel of the miracle. So in our modern day context within our churches, right, right, there might be miracles happening and perhaps the man of God, the woman of God is laying hands on somebody and, you know, praying for healing and a miracle occurs. Right. We don't give credit to the person. Right. We give credit to God. Right. OK, mm -hmm. so that's one purpose. Here's the second one. Miracles occur mm -hmm. to meet human needs. Mm -hmm. God still wants to miraculously meet your needs. Okay, so keep those purposes in your pocket as we go throughout uh, today's Bible study. Okay, Absolutely. now uh, we want to unpack a miracle, uh, and I think it's important to use the principle of first mention. Mm -hmm. And all that basically means is the first time that you kind of see something in the Bible, it sets precedent moving forward. Right. Now, there's an Old Testament kind of uh, feel to that, that miracles that happen. But I'm specifically speaking of the first time that Jesus activates his miracle working power yeah. within his ministry. Right. So we're going to look at the narrative of wedding at Cana. And that's going to be found in John chapter number two, verses one through 11. Now, here I get to say this. Can you read that for us? <laughs> here we go. All right. All right. On the third day at the wedding, sorry, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus's mother was there and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus's mother told him, they don't have any wine. What does this have to do with you and me, woman? Jesus asked. Mm. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now, six stone water jars have been set aside for Jewish purification. Mm. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some water out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. 
When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first, then after people are drunk, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Mm. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Mm. That last part was good, Mm y'all. Okay. So what we want to do is somewhat of an exegesis and an eisegesis. We're Mm going to try to provide some direct interpretation and then give you something else to kind of think about from an eisegesis standpoint. So um, what's the first first little part here that we want to explore? Before I even say that, I do want to mention that we were able to kind of watch this visually the other week um, looking at The Chosen. If you have not got a chance to see The Chosen series Mm. about the life of Jesus, please check that out. Yes. Thechosen.tv. They also have an app. Um, so we also have some visuals to kind of, that we'll kind of throw in some tidbits too as well, but looking at it just simply, you know, the first verse, you know, what was kind of happening? What day was the wedding on? Yeah. Yeah. What's the significance there? Yeah, no, that's good. The, The day of the wedding took place three days after the interaction with John the Baptist in John chapter number one. So whenever you're studying the scripture, you often want to go back to what happened before and then what's going to happen after the specific, you know, portion of scripture that you're that you're reading. But this basically happened three days after that interaction where John was like, hey, that's the Lamb of God. Speaking of Jesus, Uh, it would have, you know, taken three days to actually travel from where that scene occurred in the scripture in John chapter one to the point of reaching the village of Cana. Right. Um, So. You know, kind of want to add some additional eisegesis to that, though. From from a spiritual standpoint, one might connect the fact that Jesus would die on the cross and after three days, right? We're looking at that significance of the number three. After three days, he would be raised from the dead, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Jesus in this particular narrative, which we're going to read or which we just read, right? He changes water into wine. On this third day, both mm-hmm. of these things signify Jesus's power to produce greater quality, right? Mm-hmm. He died and was rose again and now provides the new birth. And in this particular narrative, he's going to change water into wine, providing the new wine, right? right? So yeah. that's some, you know, eisegesis to kind of play around with. Absolutely. Um, And so when you also think about weddings and this kind of goes into like verse two, you know, who was at the wedding? I know at our wedding, I think Mm. we had too many people at our wedding. And just like we watched in the episode of The Chosen, Mm -hmm. they had planned for so many people and then more people showed up. And that's Mm. exactly what happened to us too. We planned for a certain amount of people, but then more people showed up. So who was there that was significant? Yeah. So you have, you know, Jesus' mother, Mary, right, who was Mm -hmm. at the wedding, as well as Jesus himself and Mm -hmm. his disciples. And, you know, kind of a nugget that I put here, sometimes we could be called to a place, Mm -hmm. invited Mm -hmm. to a place uh, because of our connection with someone else. Right. Jesus was there not because of his own merit or his relationship with that bride or groom, Mm -hmm. but because of his mother. And he's going to actually impact all of the participants of the wedding because he was invited or brought because of his mother, right? Right. And so sometimes you can be in a place or invited to a place Mm -hmm. because of someone else that you're connected to, not because of your own merit or your own relationship, but you're there to be a blessing that people don't even know you're going to be a blessing for. Absolutely. And I think it's key that he was invited. And I think it symbolizes us inviting Jesus into our own lives. Mm. Um, When we're in situations, you may not even know what, that you need something, I don't want to get ahead here, Yeah. <laughs> that you uh, didn't know you needed, but again, inviting him in, I think that was key, you know, yeah. as yeah. well. So looking yeah. at verse three, um, and I'll read it again just to kind of, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him they don't have any wine. Mm. So what was kind of the importance there? She went to him to say, hey, this is a problem. Yeah, yeah. A couple of things to, to really uh, denote from verse three. Let's first start off with the wedding feast. You know, in our modern day context, a wedding is just kind of like that one day, right? right? And you know, you go to the the uh, the reception, and then you're you're pretty much done. But 
Culturally, in this day and age, or in that day and age, a wedding feast uh, would often last up to a week. A week, right? right. That's a long time. Right. So to run out of wine in this instance would have been humiliating right. to the bride and the groom, right? right? I can only imagine going back to our wedding, mm -hmm. we had to roll out some extra tables, yes, right? Because we had so many people, yep. right? And that would have been humiliating for the bride and the groom to have run out of wine, literally like on the first day of the wedding <laughs> the feast, first. right? Yes. So, you know, we too have come close to the brink. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been in a situation where you were close to being ashamed of something that was happening in your life? Mm -hmm. You were almost to the point of being humiliated. Right. right? These occurrences are common in our human experience. Mm -hmm. uh, these are often the moments that Jesus shows up. Right. Um, so that's one part. But another thing here is Mary went to Jesus to tell him they had no wine. Jesus was not a part of the wedding party, right? Right. He was not a part of, you know, uh, the waiting staff, any of that. Mm -hmm. Mary went to Jesus mm -hmm. and told him that they had no wine. He was not responsible for the success of the wedding. Right. But Mary knew he was the only one who could bring a solution to the problem. And just again, to add a little bit more context mm -hmm. to what we saw when we watched the show is that you have several people at this wedding asking where the wine is. So when you read it, we just think about Mary coming mm. to him saying we're out of wine. But think about all the guests that are there. They're like, where's the wine? Where's the wine? What's going on? So now we have this chaos and this mayhem kind of building up because yeah. people are wondering what is going on. Yeah, no, you that's know? good. And I want to just add this. Part of getting an answer to uh, the miracle is knowing the one who can perform the miracle, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. she, Mary knew that they were out of wine. They can't go to the store right now, right? He can't right. do any of that. We're here. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us as believers to know who we can go to to right. get a miracle through. Absolutely. Not for ourselves, but for somebody else, mm -hmm. right? You have been given this anointing. You've been positioned in close mm -hmm. proximity to the miracle worker so that you can call on him to perform a miracle for who needs it. Absolutely. Look, yeah. We got to move. Yep. All right. <laughs> Verse four. Again, what does this have to do with you and me? Woman, Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. What does that mean? Yeah. This is important because Jesus had not mm -hmm. yet been physically revealed as <clears throat> the Messiah. Right. right. The one who would come and deliver Israel from their oppression. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, John understood who he was by revelation in the previous chapter. He said, man, this is the Lamb of God. Right. right? Yeah. But he had not yet performed a miracle that would announce his actual arrival in flesh. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. That that would be key. That would be huge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of us have heard of Jesus. Right. We have mm -hmm. read about him in scripture. But there is a moment where Jesus will actually perform a miracle in your life that announces, I am here. I am here. I am in your life. I am resident in your heart. Mm -hmm. I am with you, mm -hmm. right? And I encourage you. You got to go mm -hmm. beyond just reading about him, right? No, yes. you have to have a revelation through experience. When you have an experience with God, nobody can take that away from you. So you got to get to that point. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I love Mary's response in verse five that mm -hmm. says, do whatever he tells you, because at this point she's come and she's laid it at his feet. And she said, whatever mm. he does, I'm good with. Yep. There was no arguing. There was no fussing about it. She just says, do whatever he tells you. Yeah. Because at this point I've given it over to him and I know he's going to provide. I know he's going to fulfill this need. And and that is a beautiful picture of how we should mm -hmm. act and how we should, you know, go about the miracle working power of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mary places a demand on the miracle worker. Right. I know this ain't your time. I know this is not your hour. Mm -hmm. But hey, servants, do what he tell you to do. Right? right. That is placing a demand. How how could God not respond? Right. When you place that type of demand, we must put a demand on the anointing of God to move in our lives. I think I heard somebody say that this past Sunday. I don't know if you did. Yeah, I heard him say it. <laughs> Shout out to Pastor Holland. Yes, yes sir. When you're in the presence of God or when you're preparing to go into the presence of God, um, go in with great expectations. What yeah. is God going to do for me on today? What am I going to hear? What am I going to experience? So that's, good. that's really key, really key. All right, looking at um, 
let's see, verse six and seven kind of go, you know, go together. So mm -hmm. we have these jars with these six empty, huge jars that hold all this water. So we're talking a total of about 160 to 180 gallons Ooh. of water that had to be filled. And so Jesus kind of says to the servants, you know, go fill them up to the brim with water. Mm. And when I read that, I just thought about how that was an act of faith on their part. Yeah. Because we're asking for wine and you're telling us to go and get some water. Mm. Um, but you see, there's not a big dialogue or exchange or them questioning him like, what do you mean go fill these up? Why would we waste our time filling this up with water? We need wine. But they did as they were told in, yeah. in faith. In yeah, no, so, that's good. And as you're moving in faith, you have to understand that it may require some strength. Right. Could you imagine filling up all those many gallons of mm -hmm. water going back to wherever they're retrieving the water from right. to pour it in? And he said, fill it up to the brim. Don't shortchange me. <laughs> right. right. Give me all that you've got. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you come to the end of yourself, when you come to the brim of your situation, mm -hmm. God will then activate his miracle working power. I feel that. Yes. Give everything that you have into what Jesus is going to do in your life. When you come to your end, that is when Jesus comes to his beginning. Amen. And let's Amen. not neglect or forget there's still chaos going on at this wedding because just like you said, how long do you think it would have taken them to mm, fill up yeah. all of these gallons? I mean, just to sit at home and fill up one gallon jug. Mm -hmm. So again, there's still a lot going on in the background. People are getting restless and they're asking questions. And yet God is behind the scenes working regardless of, you know, mm. what people are saying or doing. God is still working. He has people that are filling waters. He's preparing himself to get ready to perform his first miracle. Um, so keep that in mind. Ooh, a whole too. miracle working process <clears throat> is happening in the background of in your situation. Background. In the background. In the background. Yes. Okay. What's so, verses 9 and 11? What's that 9 through about? 11, we're just talking about um, the head waiter tasted the wine and he didn't know where it came from, even though the servants had knew. Now, this is just a question I want to throw out to you. Um, the servants didn't say, hey, we know where this, we know where this came from. Mm -hmm. No, the head waiter is tasting it and then he's getting ready, ready to make his own announcement. But the servants stayed in their place, quote unquote. They yeah. didn't say anything. They had witnessed this miracle. And this is just my own interpretation. I think they were just so in awe and amazed at what just took place that they didn't even have the wherewithal to be like, oh, Jesus did that, Jesus. I think they were so amazed by mm. what was taking place with this miracle yeah. that, you know, they just watched it play out, you mm. know? And sometimes you can be in the presence of a miracle happening and you don't have the words to even describe what's going on. You can't even say, you know what? God is healing me right now. God is touching me right now. Yep. Um, but this is what's happening. So the head waiter, you know, says everyone sets out the fine wine first. So he said the best for last. Yes, he I did. Love he I love that. You know, as you're talking about the servants, I'm thinking about other characters in this narrative. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about everybody else. Mm -hmm. All the other attendants of the wedding didn't know that it was a miracle. They okay. just knew that it was the best wine that they ever tasted. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. I, I find that to be very fascinating that oftentimes God will work a miracle in your life and people won't necessarily know how it came about. Mm -hmm. They might not even know that it's a miracle. They just know that there is a greater quality about right. your life. See, when people look at you, mm -hmm. they don't know how, how it is that you're so blessed. Yep. They don't know how you came out of the fire. Mm -hmm. They don't know if you had the money to pay for the mm -hmm. eviction. They don't know that you didn't have grocery, but now you got gro They don't know any of that. Right. All they know is that you're still here, wow. right? That there's a greater quality <laughs> that's on your life. And for whatever reason, you just seem to be operating without care or worry. Mm -hmm. But they don't know that Jesus was performing a miracle in the background of your life. And so that is the awe and the wonder of God operating and moving and shifting. And I, I just found that to be fascinating. They just knew, man, this is the best wine I've ever tasted. You should be able to walk around and tell yourself you're in the presence of a miracle. Come on now. <laughs> you're Come in the on. presence of a miracle. You don't know what God has been doing behind the scenes Preach. in my life. You are in the presence of a miracle. Yes. All right. Last verse, 11. Jesus did this as the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed 
his glory mm -hmm. and his disciples believed him. And of course, like we said, we wanted to talk about this first. And as I've read other things and heard people talk about the scripture, he could have done a lot of other things to yeah. show who he was. But this one was the first one. Yeah. You got any thoughts? Yeah. That? Now, a couple of things, right? Mm -hmm. To reveal his glory, right? It, yes. it puts an emphasis on the glory. And that mm -hmm. goes back to our opening on what is a miracle mm -hmm. and the purpose of a miracle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but I really want us to think that God doesn't just want to grow the limb, you know, grow your leg out if it's short. He doesn't want right. to just give sight to the blind. He wants to ensure that you will not be broken, crushed, and humiliated. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> God will break through in a miracle in your everyday life. Yes. The things that you are concerned about, mm -hmm. God will reveal his miracle working power in just your average everyday life. Absolutely. That's how close God wants to walk with you. Not just in the big things, but in the small things too. Absolutely. And we got three key points. And one of them we've been touching on throughout is your miracle is not just for you. Yeah, that's good. You know, by this water being turned into wine, we talk about um, the lack of humiliation now that, you know, this family doesn't have to endure that. But we have servants who witness it, who now can go and tell people about the glory of God. And then we have um, the disciples who were just, you know, probably coming together with him and they're able to see what they uh, maybe have been feeling in their spirits about him. Mm -hmm. So it's not just for you um, when the God performs a miracle in your life. Yeah. Point number two, if you are experiencing mayhem and chaos, look for God to perform a miracle. Just like yeah. we were saying, when you feel like all hell is breaking out, um, breaking loose in your life, say, God, where is the miracle? I'm expecting it. It's yeah. coming. It's got to be on its way. You're working behind the scenes. Rem remember this story mm -hmm. so that you can be reminded of the process and the things that he can do when we're not even uh, paying attention um, in our lives. And then the third point is miracles are intended to build our faith. I mean, just mm -hmm. think about the disciples being able to witness Woo. this. And now they're following somebody that they just witnessed um, a miracle from. Mm -hmm. I ain't got no more questions. I just seen you turn water into wine. I mean, you had, mm -hmm. when you even think about it, you think about water being changed on a, mo a molecular level <laughs> <laughs> and its quality having to be changed. Yeah. I ain't got no more questions for Jesus. I'm just mm -hmm. following whatever you say. Hey, I'm here. Let's roll. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. Absolutely. That's good. Yes. So listen, that wraps up part one. We're going to come back here real soon with part two and we're going to just continue to explore more of Jesus's miracle working power. You got anything for the people before we get out of here? Um, I think that's it. <laughs> that's it, y'all. Hey, we'll see you on the next one. God bless.